and now at war. There are but two alternatives, total victory or total defeat. There can be no such thing as a military stalemate that would result in the survival of Hitlerism. That is the opinion of a man who knows. Douglas Miller, for 15 years commercial attaché to the American Embassy in Berlin, presenting a radio series adapted from Mr. Miller's book, You Can't Do Business with Hitler, episode three. No American goods wanted. This is Douglas Miller speaking. December 9, 1941 will go down in history as a date on which Adolf Hitler declared war on the United States. History, in one sense, will be wrong. Actually, Adolf Hitler launched an undeclared war against us as early as 1934. Yes, I said 1934, seven years ago. This was not a shooting war, but the Nazis used every weapon at their command except shooting to destroy our government, divide our people, steal our military secrets, and cripple our standard of living. These weapons were sabotage, propaganda, the fifth column, espionage, and last but not least, the weapon of international trade. Nazi officials in Berlin were busy scheming to destroy America's prosperity. Now let's get down to the cases. The case of James Dennison, typical of thousands of others. Dennison was an American businessman who in 1937 was trying to sell the products of American labor to Germany and the rest of the world. One day he came to see me at my office in Berlin. Judge, I'm in a terrible jam and you have to help me. Well, what's wrong? Well, I've been shipping tallow from New York and selling it to the Germans. I have a whole shipload of tallow at Hamburg, and the German authorities won't permit me to unload it. What? Not for heaven's sake. Well, let me explain. You see, this is beef tallow. The Germans use beef tallow to make soap, but it could be used to make oleomargarine. Oh, I see. You've run into the Nazi regulation that forbids Germans to eat food grown in America. That's it. And even though my tallow is used for soap, the Nazis insist that since it's remotely possible that someone might use it to make oleomargarine, it must be called food. I tell you, Doug, this whole mess is driving me crazy. Haven't you a contract with the Nazis? Contract? You know what they think of a contract. Yes, the proverbial scrap of paper. Well, all I can do, Jim, is to get in touch with the Nazi party big bridge and try to talk them into giving you a break. In the meantime, you just sit tight. <laughs> How do you do, uh, Herr Lufthansa? Heil Hitler. Won't you be sitting? Fine, I prefer to stand. Oh. Uh, well, now, uh, you're uh, familiar with the case of Mr. Dennison, Herr Lufthansa? Quite familiar. Good. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Dennison wishes to appeal the ruling that forbids him to unload his cargo. Impossible. Herr Dennison's behavior has been little sort of criminal. Oh, come, come, come now, Herr Lufthansa. How is it you suddenly label criminal something you've approved of for some time? Furthermore, Denison has a contract that violates national socialistic principles. And any such contract is invalid. Oh, really? Well, why then did you not the officials in the Ministry of Economics sign it? Because Sir Denison... Because Sir Denison deliberately deceived them. Oh, now that's sheer nonsense. Will you please explain precisely what national socialistic principle Mr. Denison has violated? The eternally sacred principle that German blood be completely and forever linked with holy German soil. <laughs> Is there something unholy, then, about Denison's beef tallow? Yeah, it is edible. It comes from America. No true Aryan German can eat food grown anywhere but in Germany. All right, all right, I won't argue that point. But the tallow is to be made into soap. Defining it as food seems to me the thinnest kind of technicality and one with no other purpose than to evade your contract obligation. That remark is insulting, Herr Miller. But Mr. Denison can't understand. No, I expect him to understand. He's mercenary and grasping and intent solely upon making money. How can he understand ideals or ethics or sacred principles or what is most holy to the German people? However, ignorance is immaterial. The fellow will not be permitted in Germany, and that is final. I need that. Herr Bonder, wait. Herr Bonder. Oh, the bomb of young madman. He actually believes all that rot. <laughs> case of James Dennison is only one of hundreds of similar cases. Germany was out to dominate the trade markets of the world. All of his satellite neighbors, 
and her military victims were to cooperate with the Nazis in not only refusing American goods, but also in driving America out of the other trade markets of the world. The Nazis preferred to see Germans do with ours rather than purchase our manufactured goods. This harsh regulation was very hard on many Germans. I recall one very pathetic example. A German friend of mine, a kindly, gentle old doctor, who had bought an American-made automobile before Hitler came to power and consequently before the restrictions were enforced. I called on my friend one day and discovered him working in his car. Oh, hey, Nina. I'm so glad you've come to see us. You are just the one to help us. Father, now you have nothing to worry about. Sir Miller's an American, and all Americans are experts with problems in mechanics. Well, you flatter me, Colin. I <laughs> think the trouble is in this, in this thing here, here, Miller. Oh, the carburetor. Yeah, the carburetor. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid it's beyond repair, Doctor. You see this crack right across the face here? Hmm. But there must be some way to fix it. No, I'm sorry. The only thing you can do is to buy a new one. Buy a new one? But that, that is impossible. Oh, Father, does that mean we have to... Your, your current our automobile is useless to us now. Doctor, you, you mean you must junk a $1,000 car for lack of a $10 part? Yeah. American parts cannot be bought anywhere in Germany. The government forbids importing American parts. And nowhere else can I get the right kind of, uh, what you call it, the carburetor? If you know how we saved our money to buy an automobile, Herr Miller, so that the hair doctor could be able to call an office And I've had it only a year. Father, perhaps if you talk to the party leader? I, I already know what he will say, that I am unpatriotic. Then because I can't use the automobile, he would take it from me for scrap hair, Miller, for magic. Scrap? Yeah, to make bombs and cannons. But, Father, how will you be able to call now on all the patients? You have so many. But I don't know. Seems, Hitler, everything is in good Now, well, Papa, be careful. This automobile, Herr Miller, what a fine useful thing it is you Americans have made. Useful to a doctor and useful to the patient who waits for the doctor. When delay means suffering and haste means healing. But, oh, scrap. To make something like this now into things to kill me. Uh, I've lived too long, Hermann. Times like these are not so much. trying to show to what lengths the Nazis carried their trade war against America 
To show they would never buy our surplus food nor our surplus manufactured goods. Nazi propagandists have proven this very same point. Not by intent, but because of a blunder. On a certain day in March 1941, in the New York offices of the German-American Commerce Bulletin, located at number 10 East 40th Street, one of the editors was glancing over the most recently published copy of the magazine when... God damn you! Wait! Wait! Let me at once! Oh, you I'm phoning, I'm phoning. What is the matter? Matter? Ah! Eat! Fine roulette! I thought I told you to cut out that arc with your face. What? You cut it out? Oh, nine. I did not understand. You did not that. understand. You did not understand. Ah! You do not understand anything. We are ruined. Completely ruined. But why? I have done nothing. Nothing, you said. This fine put a contradiction in the magazine and his face he had done nothing. Wait. Will you please turn the magazine to place for him? I have to do it and I know, I know I'm a fool. It is my own act to obey three that all I want. Right, all right, all right. I am finding it. Ah, here it is. Good. Now he sleep what I have written. Yeah. <coughs> Germany with more than 100 million people could easily buy from the United States each year three to four billion bales of cotton and a great variety of finished products. Go on, go on. If reasonable and normal trade relations could once more be established between both countries. Now, read your article on page 12. Yeah, but it is not my article. It is Eric Neumann. I know, but it is the one I told you not to think about. Yes. Read. Yeah. Eric Neumann writes, <clears throat> All we Germans wish to do is to make ourselves independent of the outside world in the domains of foodstuffs and industrial materials. All other products... I can't. Now, do you see what you have done? On page three, we tell the Americans Germany wants their cotton and wheat and lard and meat and food and finished products. And on page 12, we tell them just the opposite, that we don't want their foodstuffs and manufacturing. Oh, you fool. Oh, but that article produced by Eric Newman, Secretary of State in the German Ministry of Economics. He tells how he plans to take the American trade markets away from them. It's true. It's true. Why? We are not supposed to tell the truth. But Eric Newman is a high official. But he wrote that article for Germans to read, not for Americans. I told you that of me. But I thought... You are. You are. You can't do business with Hitler. You have been listening to episode three in a radio series entitled you can't do business with Hitler. This series is based upon the actual experiences of Douglas Miller, who was for 15 years commercial attaché to the American Embassy in Berlin. Listen to the next episode in this series, which is entitled Two for Me and One for You, and gives you the real inside story on a much-discussed subject, Nazi barter method. This program was prepared and directed by Frank Shelford and brought to you by the Office for Emergency Management in Washington. Thank you.